I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Today on the DCC Guy, I want to talk about some confusing terminology that's part of the DCC uh, te uh, lexicon, and it's something that, as I say, confuses a lot of newcomers, but also I think there are a lot of folks that have been using DCC for a while who really don't completely understand what some of this terminology means. So uh, in a second, I'll get started with that. First, I want to point out that the uh, quality of the sound and of the video um, may not be as good as you have uh, come to expect uh, from the videos that I've done recently. The reason for that is when I got ready to make this video today, my Sony camera uh, crapped out on me. So I'm having to do this with an old point and shoot uh, Nikon Coolpix that unfortunately does not have the capability for an external microphone. So I'm having to use the internal microphone on the camera itself. And um, it's, it's just not up to the same quality as the Sony can do. So uh, until I can get this uh, resolved, um, well, I would, I'm just going to have to put up with doing uh, videos that aren't as good as I would hope. So uh, please bear with me while I get this uh, worked out. Um, for now, though, let's go ahead and uh, talk about some of these confusing uh, terminologies. Okay, so the, the first thing I want to uh, talk about is the, uh, the terminology uh, uh, conformance. So what does conformance mean? Well, uh, since 2006, the NMRA has um, had a program of uh, at least certifying new products that they are uh, compliant or conformant with uh, all of the appropriate standards and recommended practices uh, for DCC. And this is a self-certification program, which means that a manufacturer, when they put out a new product that's uh, DCC related, they can go online, download a form, fill it out, explaining uh, what the product is and does and how it meets the uh, recommended or the, the uh, standards and, and RPs um, for the NMRA. And once they fill that out, you know, and send it into the NMRA, it will be evaluated. And if it does in fact conform to all of the standards and RPs, then they get a conformance warrant and they get to have this little uh, gold football on their product or on their packaging. And that is called a conformance seal. And basically it tells you that the product does meet all of the appropriate uh, applicable uh, standards and recommended practices for DCC. So you can plug in a decoder into a locomotive and it's and expect it to operate properly. Uh, your command stations and decoders and accessory decoders will all work interchangeably because they meet all of the requirements of the, of the NMRA with respect to DCC standards. So it's, it's basically then, um, it's like the good housekeeping seal of approval or whatever. It's the NMRA seal of approval for this particular product that you're looking to buy. So you can feel, you know, comfortable in purchasing it, that it's not going to be something that's not going to work. Now, after that, there is a, a term called uh, compliant or, you know, DCC compliant. And that is very similar. And, and it used to mean something a little bit more different. But today, it's basically, as far as I'm concerned, the same thing as conformance. Because all it is is the manufacturer saying that their product complies with all of the standards and RPs. So really, it's just one step short of getting a conformance warrant and a conformance seal on their packaging. It just means they haven't filled out the form and sent it into the NMRA. So as far as I'm concerned, there's really no difference between conformance and compliance, except that one has the NMRA conformance warrant in their hand or their files and has the little gold football on their product packaging and the other one doesn't. So there's really not that much difference between conformant and compliant 
as far as I'm concerned. Um, okay, so those, those deal with that side of it. Let's talk then about what DCC ready means, because that is a very commonly bandied about term with respect to products, particularly locomotive products. Um, this particular product here is a Bachmann uh, 060. It is a uh, British uh, prototype, uh, basically. And as you can see, it has a little circuit board here. Now that circuit board does not have a socket for a decoder to be plugged into it. So it's not, in my uh, terminology, or as far as I would uh, define it, DCC ready. As far as I'm concerned, in order to be DCC ready, it has to have a socket of some sort in the locomotive so that you can plug in a decoder of some kind, be it an 8-pin, a 6-pin, um, you know, a 21 MTC uh, socket, or an 18-pin uh, socket. Although the motor itself is isolated from the chassis, there are two wires going to it, you can wire a decoder into it fairly easily, but because it doesn't have a socket, I don't consider that DCC ready. Now, this is an almost identical model, um, uh, 060 British prototype from Bachmann. And as you can see here, this one does have a six pin plug. So this one is DCC ready. Uh, it's otherwise the motor, the wiring, everything else is identical to that, but this one allows you to plug in a decoder without any hassle at all. You can simply take the blanking plug right here out and plug in a new decoder into it and you're ready to operate. I'm going to set this down before I break a pin. But that's how simple this is. So there's just tons of locomotives on the market today that come with decoders in them. There are a lot, the majority of them, come with some sort of socket uh, that allows you to plug in a decoder and, you know, you can expect it to operate perfectly uh, after that. And then there are still a few in production, though, that you might run across or on the secondhand market that are not DCC ready. They do not have a socket of any kind. There's also a lot of, of products floating around that uh, in the past that used what was called a split frame or a split chassis uh, construction. And that means the chassis itself is cast in two halves with the motor in between usually and the uh, brush contacts on the motor are right up against uh, with wipers or some sort of configuration those two halves. So they uh, receive their power directly from contact with the two halves and those are the hardest to convert to DCC. Uh, it can be done. I've got a couple of locomotives around here that I have converted to DCC that use that split flame approach. It was very common in Inscale for quite a while, but at any rate, there were a, a, a lot of these split uh, frame chassis um, that are very difficult to convert. So they're, I don't think they're DCC ready either, to be honest with you. Um, the other side of the coin in the terminology is DCC friendly. And I use DCC friendly a lot. I've written about uh, DCC friendly. Uh, the term goes back oh, to the 1990s when uh, Alan Gartner, uh, who has a very popular uh, and very good uh, website, wiringfordcc.com, and he coined the term DCC friendly. And he used it in the context of turnouts and whether or not a turnout was designed and built so that uh, if a locomotive dis derailed going through it or you know managed to clip uh, the front and back of the wheels managed to contact the stock rail or the point rail whether or not you would get a short and basically if it was DCC friendly it was built so that you would not get a short going through that uh, set of points. Uh, probably the worst offenders for that were the old Shanahara turnouts that uh, Walther sold for a long, long time. But now, you know, Walther's produces DCC-friendly turnouts, and they're wired in a specific way, so you won't get a short when you go through that uh, turnout and derail. 
Um, all, I, I have expanded that DCC friendly concept to a lot of other things so that the locomotive is, is easy to convert to DCC because the motor itself is isolated completely from the frame. I consider that DCC friendly because there are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, models and there are still some that are produced that have the motor connected to the frame and use it as part of the electrical path. And those type of, uh, of, of that type of an arrangement, under certain circumstances, it, you can uh, create a dead short through the uh, through the chassis connection, and that can create problems for you. You might blow out a decoder. So it's very important to be able to isolate that motor if you're going to install a decoder in it. And like I said, there are some uh, locomotives still out there being produced that uh, do not have uh, a motor that is isolated from the frame. And this type of thing carries over to a lot of other uh, concepts in DCC as to whether or not it is DCC friendly. Um, turnouts in particular are the big one. Um, motors on, on locomotives are the other big things that I see as, as being DCC friendly or not. Um, well, that's, that's about all I have to say on this one. Um, this has been kind of a short video simply because of the problems I'm having with the, uh, with the camera issues. So I'm going to go ahead and, and make it a little bit shorter and move on and uh, work on the camera some more and see if I can get this, uh, the other camera working again. So um, have a good week. Hopefully I'll be back up uh, in time to get a video out by Thursday. I don't know though, I've got a new battery on the way just in case that's the problem. If it goes beyond a battery, the camera's going to have to go in for repairs. So I have no idea how long that will take. So bear with me while this is ongoing. Thanks a lot now. Bye.